Lord, I thank you for each and every person in this room. Lord, I thank you for the many call, the, the many uh, ways that they're called to serve in their communities, their churches. Lord, the kingdom of God. Lord, I thank you for the way that they've been a blessing. And Lord, I just pray that this would be a building block uh, to help grow them as writers so that they can be even a greater blessing to the community of faith and to those who have not yet heard and to those who are growing in their faith. Lord, we just pray that this would be a meaningful time, exchange of information and facts in a way that will last. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for your presence here with us. Amen. Each of you are at amazingly different places in life, amazing different places in what you need writing for. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about who, what, where, where, how, and why later, which is as colorful as uh, the nature outside our window there. So, Diane, uh, Diane has been writing. Come up, Diane has been writing for many, many years. She's written many books, been involved in many projects, big, large, hard, long-winded. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, it's editing. She writes and she edits, and I'll tell you, we, there's stories to be told. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, she's experienced, and she's gotten through all of them, one way or another. She's gone through all of them. Thank you, sir. And then she just finished. Why don't you tell them the deadline you just finished? That was oh, actually yeah. Come. I'll start with two stories. One is that she, well, great to see all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit, well, it should be a lot, I should say a lot trembling in my boots because no. I don't know what some of you are doing here, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> You should be in this position. <laughs> That's what I mean to say, Lorraine, Reina, and Dominic. Some of you should be in this position. But I should say, okay, cut. I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> That's what I meant to we say. We do. You, you do it well. So. <laughs> Yeah, let's go ahead and hand out the, the paper. We won't look at it quite yet. Sarah, Sarah said that we've been in some interesting situations. There was one book I edited recently that I was told afterwards that several and somebody else had said, I can't edit this because I want to be your I still want to be your friend. I mean that's what oh. that's what someone had told the author. You know, I'm not gonna touch this. I so I guess I guess I wasn't trying to start with so <laughs> No, but it's all good. Um, yes, most recently, I have written in the past a book on parenting and a lot of articles and I've been an editor actually more than a writer. I enjoy editing more than writing, so <laughs> but I've done both. But most recently, I've gotten involved in writing curriculum for Kenyan schools. It was really interesting. It started with, um, can you do a little storybook for the, like the three-year-olds, the four-year-olds, you know, run, Jack, run. Yeah. Run, Tim, run, hit the ball. Everyone's happy type story. Anyway, we started like that, both, both my husband and I, and then um, it, I think they must have liked something that they saw because the publisher asked us to write more and asked me to write more specifically, and then I started by writing curriculum for the early childhood. Kenya's, Kenya's curriculum is being completely changed. The national curriculum for the schools is completely changing from a exam-based, um, normative assessment-based system to a, a completely different system. Anyway, so all the books have to be written afresh. Wow. So I've gotten started with that. I think we probably, I think I have over 50 titles now. Wow. Wow. But, but I mean, remember, run, Jack, run. <laughs> <laughs> but the most recent one was, is we did great well, we just submitted grade seven, but we this is, was grade six. So if anybody's interested in seeing what's going out into the Kenyan schools, you can have a look at this later. Just before we, yeah, you can have a look at it. Just before, a week before we came, we had 15 books that were being submitted. Everything has to go to the Institute of Curriculum Development to be approved before it can go out into the market. So we had those titles going in for, for vetting or for, <laughs> for the evaluation system. So it was a busy season, but anyway, that's just a little bit of background of some of the things that I've been writing. But what I really have enjoyed doing in the last four, five, six, seven, I don't know, five or six years, I'm not sure, is doing some editing for partnership, partnership publications and house to house. And I really appreciate that. And some of you have written and submitted and published. And, and congratulations. Yeah, it's, it's great to see people getting their ideas and their 
vision and their message on paper and into people's hands. So that's that's the kind of things that I do and enjoy doing apart from everything else I do. Okay, so we have a paper here, How to Become a Writing Pro, P-R-O. We'll get to the P-R-O's a little bit later, but I won't necessarily follow this very closely. You can maybe keep it for later or follow along. Um, we just, Sarah already said who, what, when, where. I think I'll start with that also. The five W's, why? But the why is probably the most important. Why do you want to write? Why do we want to write? Um, sometimes, I don't think we probably want to write to get rich, but maybe we still do. I mean, that's one motivation that could be out there, or at least to get, maybe not rich, but get, get an income. But mostly it's, it's to express something that's on our hearts. And hopefully most of us here would feel like God has asked me to write. God, I have a mandate from the Lord to get something into paper that has been on my heart. Maybe teachings, maybe you know, to, to build up the body of Christ. Or maybe it's an area of a profession where you just want to get the information out there. Maybe you want to express yourself. Maybe you want to impress other people. I mean, many things that I write, read, seem like they've been written to just make an impression, okay? Not bad, not necessarily bad, or to share ideas, or to just, sh as I said, share what is on, God has put on your heart. And we really, really need written materials. I know that we're going to internet age, we're going to e-books and audio books and, and all of that, and yet the the pen on paper, the, the written materials are still needed, and they're needed in the body of Christ. People are reading more than ever before, but not reading well. They're reading little snippets. They're reading junk. Okay, sorry. They're reading, you know. I, I feel it's very important that the body of Christ get good, have good reading materials out there for people to be able to really learn and grow from and develop, and we bring the, see the kingdom move forward. So why? You know, when things get difficult and you're tired of it and you've been up for three, 3 o'clock in the morning and you're tired of getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning, every morning to do your two hours of writing before the day starts, you really have to know the why. Why am I doing this? And I think that's an important starting place. So again, going before the Lord, is this, you know, is this of you, God? Why should I do this? Why should I write? Be it an article, a blog, a book, a, a, a magazine, whatever it is. Why am I doing this? Um, who are you writing for is a very important question as well. Another W. Um, when Larry Kreider was often says when he's teaching, teaching or speaking to writers that he was told early on to put somebody's picture in, on a table in front of him as he was writing. So he has a picture of that who. I find that I often like imagine my audience to be somebody. And when, like for example, our blog, we have a blog that we don't write very regularly, sorry. If you follow, please forgive us. Sure. <laughs> it comes for a couple weeks and then it doesn't come, and then it comes and it doesn't come. But I find that I, I, I have a certain person or just like a few people that I feel like I'm writing to. And it really, really is important to, to think about that. Who do I want to have read this book? Who, who is going to be interested in what I have to say? And then know your audience. What are their interests? What are their needs? I mean, it's a product, right? So just like any kind of advertising, um, advertising principles, you know, know your audience, know what they need, know, know, your, know their felt needs, know what you're trying to communicate to them, know what will interest them. It's kind of the same, it is the same thing with writing, to really know who you're trying to meet. But you're always going to have the onlookers, right? Many people who will read who aren't necessarily the target audience. That's great. The more onlookers we have, the better. But it's important to have a clear picture of who, the, who you're writing for. If it's for children, what age children? If it's for you know, adults, are they believers or are they non-church? Or are you trying to encompass both? Or if it's adults, are they people who are, have a particular professional interest? What's the demographic of those people who have that particular professional interest? So knowing your audience is really, really important. Sometimes when we get um, like the, the replies or the feedback, 
the comments on our blog and I'm like, oh, you read that? It's like, I almost feel like, oh, that wasn't for you, you know, kind of like, because I have a, a specific criteria, or a specific kind of group of people in mind that we write for. And yeah, the others are reading as well, but it is important to have that focused audience. Um, and I think in, for those of us who are in the body of Christ, believers, it's important to know whether you're, you're targeting um, pe pe churched or unchurched. And I find sometimes that there seems to be a bit of confusion in that. And it's not that the other people can't read. Other people can read what you're writing. But if you're writing a biblical foundation series to help discipleship happen in the church, then probably most of the people who would read that are already born again, right? Or if you're writing on the topic of abortion and pro-life, then you might have people coming in from that are or are not born again. So just think about that as you start to read, who am I writing for? And it really helps to focus, um, to put a, a consistent language, you know, style, to put a consistent language level when you kind of know who you're writing to. And I, as I said, other people <laughs> will still read it, hopefully, but it's good to have that focus. So why, who, know your audience, and then what are you writing? In this, we were, we were talking about different types of writing, and of course, there are blogs. There are, um, very effective by the way, there are things we put on Facebook. There is the writing that Sarah always asks for. Right? We need articles, we need reports, we need information, we need inspirational stories. I, I send that appeal out to our Dove Africa community over and over and over again. You know, tell us what's happening. Send your testimony. Send your your stories. Send the the challenges. Um, those kinds of things. So it might be that. It might be um, a, a teaching, like a, a series of teachings, a study guide. It might be how-to books. It might be just te teaching or, or informational books. It might be brochures, maybe you're writing for, for another type of publication, a brochure, maybe you're writing official reports. Of course, news writing is its own complete format of its own, a different style of writing. But just know what you want to write. Um, and if you're thinking of writing a book, you better have some pretty good ideas. I mean, a book is a lot, okay? <laughs> I don't want, I'm not going to discourage anybody, but, but it's more than just one chapter, okay? A book needs a lot of thinking, a lot of content to really make it a solid book. So there could be many different things you want to write. Um, I've had, I've worked with some people who started, like this is the first thing I ever wrote, and they come up with a 500 page book, I'm like, whoa. That was a courageous step. You know, it might be better to start with something a little bit smaller articles, blog, of course blog requires consistency, yes, <laughs> which I just said we don't have, but anyway. Um, yeah, so think about what, what format, what, what format do I want to use to get this information out there? And sometimes the little bits, like I'm sure most of you might, okay, I shouldn't say most of you, but perhaps many of you follow the blogs of our DCFI um, apostolic leaders, some of them, Sorry, I'm not being critical, but some of them just take chapters from the book or sections of a book that they've written and get it out there bit by bit. That could be in a very effective way. If you have a large body of content, maybe you don't want to do publishing. Actually, I should let Sarah talk about these things. <laughs> um, maybe you don't want to actually publish a whole book, but just have content that you're going to feed out you know, week by week in a blog. But consider those things before you start. Consider what what format do I want to use? How do I want to get this information out there? And there could be many effective ways to do it. So what are you writing? When will you write? Hmm. Everybody's story is different on this one. I love writing in the middle of the night. Some people um, might set aside, you know, I can take a week off. I can take a month off. Sarah was just telling me when we were standing in the lunch line that it was hard to get anything printed recently because there was such a run on the printing presses because so many people wrote during COVID. I was like, oh, okay. And I guess our speaker said that, didn't he? That he, he Kevin Graves, he wrote his book when he had a little more time during COVID. But that tells us that writing takes time. It takes a commitment. 
it takes a commitment, especially if it's going to be regular and effective. So, you know, is it early in the morning? Is it late at night? Is it in the middle of the day? Is it a week away? Is it a month away? Is it one day a week? You know, Mondays are my writing day. Whatever it is, it's pretty important to get it figured out because what often happens is we get started with something and then don't get to it for a while. And there's nothing wrong with long-term projects. That, that's fine. You might you know, write something and then get back to it after a while, get back to it after a while. But often there's a loss of momentum. Often there's a loss of consistency when that, when that happens. So, and you might just get discouraged. Oh my, I started this three years ago and I'm still working on it. You know, and I think there are so many projects that end up not being completed because we really didn't plan about when am I going to do this? When am I going to do this? So think about the when, even as we think about the other W's. And then there is um, where. I would like to propose that just as much as we, it's beneficial to have a quiet spot, um, a sweet spot for our devotional time with the Lord, it's probably good to have a sweet spot for writing as well. And I have a, a room in our house where I go and I do this curriculum stuff. Because when I do those things, I end up screaming a lot and shouting a lot. And I have to be kind of satisfied. It's, it's very frustrating because we're given the, like we're given the learning outcomes, and you know you have to write this and this and this and then you know, I don't agree with that, and I don't think that's what the sixth graders should be learning. And that, but you have to write. It. So anyway, um, just have a spot where you know this is where I go to write, and hopefully in a, it might be a table at Starbucks, right? It might be a corner in your room. It might be, you know, it might be a chair, a table, a, whatever it is. It, for me, at least, it really helps to have that place where you know when I'm there, that's what I'm doing. And then the people around you might also learn, depending on if you have who who is around you or not around you. The people around you might also go, okay, she's over there. She's, you know, don't disturb. It's like, you have this don't do not disturb space when you have a specific place where you can do your writing. Um, and how? This is more about um, what what how how will you, how will you go about it? Like some of us still like to put pen on pen to paper, right? Um, when I do when I do thoughtful, creative, reflective writing, I find that I still have to use a pen as much as I'm great at typing, I know how to type, I know how to use a computer, but somehow that pen to paper just works. Or maybe maybe not, but how? How, how am I going to do this? And what tools do I need to be able to do it well? Because when you have to go get up and get that, and get up and get that, and you know, find, look up a dictionary. I have, in my little room, I have stuff on the windows, my charts on the windows, and I have my dictionary, and, da, 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 and different things that are right available right there. Because getting up, go and get something. Somebody needs something. You know, you get distracted. You don't get back for half an hour. So, if possible, just have your, your tools, your hows ready. If it's a desktop, laptop, tablet, notebook, pen and paper, pads, whatever it is, and the things that you would need to use as you're writing. If you can have them in one spot, the better better to have those things ready. So becoming a writing pro, this is basically just three, three P-R-O. P is, stands for plan and prepare. And particularly if we're doing books, it's really important to plan well and to think through where are you going with this. I find, not intending to be critical, but I find that many books that are out there are pretty much all written in the first chapter. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> like you can read the first yeah. chapter of a book and then you read the second chapter and you're like, I think I read this before. The third chapter, mm, I'm not getting anything new and it's rare for me to get back through more than three chapters of a book. Wow. Not, okay, maybe, not because, it just seems like it's the same ideas. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Coming in a different language, coming in a different way. and. I, we don't have time for that, do we? So as you're, as you're thinking about a book, think about what you want to say and how you want to organize it, how you want it to be laid out. Do the chapter outlines, do the, you know, the, the overall plan, particularly for a large project like that, or a blog. 
um, you know, what am I going to do week one, week two, week three? At least probably four or six weeks out, unless unless you have a gift that I don't have to just wake up on Monday, every Monday morning and write, <laughs> and you didn't think about it and you didn't plan it. But but if possible, just get those plans, plan and prepare what you really want to share, so that. It's like then your writing can fit into whatever you have planned, whatever you have intended. Read and research is the R. Um, yeah, the more we read, the better writers we are. That's just, that's just like a bottom line. The more we read, the better writers we are. And the more research we do, the richer and the more interesting and the more, um, I lost my word, but, <laughs> It, it's viable, it, it's trustable, it's trustworthy, right? The more credible, that's the word it was. The more credible our writing is, the more we research about a topic. So if it's a Bible topic, if it's a Bible thing, read all you can, research about it. You know, you will not, you won't quote all those things that you've learned, but your own body of knowledge and information and understanding will be boosted so that what you do share will be credible, valuable, useful, and helpful to your readers. So do the preparation, do the research. And then the O is outline and own. I guess I already talked about outline, <laughs> okay? Making an outline of what you want to do. Um, own your writing. Here again, many times in the books that we edit or I edit, I find people take, you know, every paragraph starts with, this might not be true in all cases, but in my own experience, I feel that. Well, you're the author, come on. Just say, this is the way it is, you know. Amen. Cats are, cats are messy. Okay, maybe not everybody agrees with you that cats are messy, but you're the writer, right? Yeah. So say what you want to say, yes. just say it. Your name is on it. If somebody yes. wants to disagree, yes. they can disagree. So that's what I mean, own your writing. This is me expressing myself. You have the right to express yourself in your book. You mm -hmm. don't have to apologize for what you're saying. You don't have to apologize. Of course, there could be some sensitive areas <laughs> where you need to walk carefully. But for the most part, just say what you want to say. Own your writing. Express wow. yourself. Be yourself. And yeah, just get out, get down, get out there what you want to communicate to people. That was the O for pro. Mm -hmm. So just before I hand over to Sarah, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what makes something readable. Because in, um, as I said, there's a lot of competition, probably more than ever, for people's attention. Uh, we know it. You know, we see people scroll through Facebook, doop, doop, doop. I don't know how they're, I don't know what they're reading. Is it just the pictures they're looking at? Or are they reading the names? And it's very rare to actually land on something and read it, you know? To actually land on something, we pick up a book, we live through it. And, uh, there's just so much blaring for our attention, for everyone's attention. So what makes things readable? One thing that um, research has shown is that people don't want to work hard when they read. Okay, now I'm not speaking about getting a university degree in engineering. We might have to read those books or those chemistry books and work hard. Yeah. But any kind of reading that's not academic, people don't want to work hard. Even, mm -hmm. even if we're learning about a, a topic in, in, in the body of Christ, in, in mm -hmm. a biblical topic or a scriptural topic, people just don't want to work hard. So what does that mean? Keep it simple. An average reader in the United States prefers somewhere around a ninth grade reading level, ninth to 10th grade reading level, even though they might be university graduates. But we don't want to have to, so what does that mean practically? Shorter sentences, 11 to 15 words, 15 to 17 words. Shorter words, one to two syllable words where possible. Of course, there's going to be others. Um, you know, avoid the, the big sounding language. Of course, sometimes we need to use certain terminology, particularly if it's something we're teaching about or teaching on. And that's something that we're trying to you know, teach a topic about. But just keep it simple. People just want to read something simple. And of course, that's where we need editors, right? That's where we need people to help us to clean up those sentences and, and tone down the writing. Much, probably 70 to 80% of what I do as an editor is just simplify. Cut and simplify, trim and simplify. 
shorten the sentences, make one, uh, a hyphen joined, a, a semicolon joined sentence into two sentences, you know, change the words, just simplify, bring it down. So again, an editor can help you with that, but generally, don't just try to write something that's big and complicated and long and whatever. Just keep it simple. People like to read what is simple. There are ways that, there's something called a fog index, where they actually do calculations, the number, average number of sentences per word, and average number of syllables, average number of words per sentence, sorry, average number of syllables per word, and they divide and multiply by whatever, and you get this, this rating. But basically what it boils down to is people just like to read the more simple, again, vis-a-vis -vis the more complex. So keep your writing simple. Um, use natural wording, you know, the way you, when I say the way we would speak, it's not very fair because we tend to speak in, like we'll speak 10 sentences before we put a full stop in when we're speaking. You just keep going and going. <laughs> but when I say the way you speak, as in, yeah, when we talk to each other, this natural sounding language is better than, you know, trying to be very crafty and technical. Um, of course, we want to appeal to the senses. So people want to feel, to hear, to, to see what we're talking about. This is a certain type of descriptive writing, perhaps, but in any situation. And if it's, if it's teachings, if it's whatever, examples, examples, examples. I'm sure, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room has read some, at least, of Larry Kreider's books. They're full of examples, aren't they? Just examples. This is my story, what happened here. This is my story. Every, if the Biblical Foundation series, I think every single you know, day, <laughs> and it's 30 it has a story or an example, a story or an example, this happened. So keep that, that's what keeps it moving. That's what keeps people attracted. It gives the human interest to our writing, of course. And somebody says, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I can identify with that. Just be, you know, be a human being and give the examples, whatever ones you can think of. That's where sometimes the research is necessary, because if you don't have your own examples or stories to give, you might need to find some. And of course, there's so much material out there. You can go online and you just get stories about anything, and as long as it's not copyrighted, and as long as it's public domain, or as long as you give appropriate acknowledgement and citation, we can, we can draw from all of that. Um, Writing grammatically correct is important, although I think sometimes it's not all that it's cracked up to be in the sense that we do need edit we do need editors. So it, I would say it's more important to just get something on paper or in the laptop, whichever it is. You know, put the pen to paper, get start writing, get it done. Later on it can be polished, later on it can be perfected, later on it can be you know, worked on or massaged or the sentences can be shortened, but getting something done. And however, if perhaps you've written once and you've noticed that everything that you wrote in a certain way has been changed, then it might be worthwhile checking out, okay, how, how do you use the sem semicolon after all? Or what does that word mean after all? Or, you know, why is that particular thing, why are the is's changed to ours or whatever it is? You know, do just refresh a little bit of grammar if you can, if you need to, um, so that you're not frustrating your editor too much <laughs> with anything that you're writing. Generally, we say show, don't tell. In other words, like I said, appeal to the senses. Rather than saying, I walked into the room and it was a mess, say, you know, napkins, um, I can't think of a messy room right now. <laughs> Toys all over the floor. The, describe it, you know. Sorry, I'm not coming up with a good example. But rather than giving dis general descriptions, give the specifics. Give what exactly you saw so that it appeals to the senses. Um, they usually say that, they often say that adverbs are weak. Use, use the right adjective. You know, instead of saying she walked slowly, let's say she strolled. Strolled is the adjective, right? that would mean almost the same thing as she walked slowly. So just little things like that, but again, that's kind of more the fine tuning maybe for the editorial side. If you have a knack for, for words and for language, think about that and make it alive. At least if you have the stories and the examples in what you write, then an editor can work with it and you know, fix it up and make it wet appealing. Um, 
Some basic rules about paragraphs, just keep it in mind. You know, a paragraph is a collection of usually three to five to seven sentences that follows a specific theme, right? Some people tend to write every other sentence is a new paragraph. Some people tend to write three or four pages and don't put in any paragraphs. Well, just think about it. I mean, it's a basic structure of writing that I think most of us learned in grade school, right? A paragraph is a collection of ideas or a collection of sentences that are on one theme and you should be able to look at that paragraph and say, okay, that's the theme, that's what it's about, and then move on to the next and next. I've noticed more, almost all books now use these subheadings. Um, yes or no, I guess it helps break up the text, it helps organize our thoughts. Like within a chapter you might have five or six subheadings, but not necessarily required. If your ideas are flowing well and you're carrying your, your readers from one paragraph to the next as you flow through your ideas, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. So um, I just wanted to encourage us that writing is, is needed. It's needed. It's needed for the body of Christ. And whatever is in there, in you, I encourage you to think about how you can get it out, how, how you can express it, how you can best, you know, which, which avenue, which means can you use best to get those messages out to people. And most important, the one thing that all successful, successful writers have in common, one thing all successful writers have in common is they started writing. <laughs> and they finished. So get started. I'm sure you'll come up with something good. <laughs> So, uh, I recently shocked myself. I read what I wrote. <laughs> this is true. A couple weeks ago, I, I wrote something and then I went back and reviewed it. I'm like, what was I thinking? So, uh, writing is a journey. And I thought, you know, what? Why are, you so many, why are some of you here? I'd love to hear. And you can hear from, from each other. To hear from each other, too. Why? What brought you here? You don't all have to share, but if you got, go ahead and say it. Why are you here? What's um, I just, I, I just decided to come because I had a dream that I was talking to someone about a book that I had framed and that I was being like interviewed or something. And so it was just out of that dream that I was like, you know what, I'm gonna go to this thing and see what's going on. It said in the description that there were like tips on publishing stuff. So I was like, you know what, I'm just gonna go because I wanna acquire some okay. resources if this dream is ever gonna come into like so I, I personally don't enjoy writing, and I personally made a deal with God that someone else is going to have to write my book, not me. <laughs> so I'm just coming to, to okay. learn. Some more. Just real quick, what brings you here? What kind of writing do you want to do? What are you thinking of? I, I've written since I was a child and always had that uh, call in my life, and then the Lord has brought that back up with uh, prophecies over me in the last few years to get back into writing. And uh, I do a lot of writing. I'm a children's pastor, so I do a lot of writing skits for the kids okay. and things Great. like that. And I've always written lots of poetry stories, but I'm, I'm halfway through writing a book that incorporates my mother's childhood stories, but I, uh, I need that. <laughs> you know, I lost a little momentum, and I need to get back into yeah. it and, and finish it and then see what else God I do put, sort of categorize writing along with weight loss and exercise <laughs> yeah. program writing. They're all sort of in the same group. Yeah. So yeah. if you're feeling like, boy, okay, I need a push. Okay, it's, it's all sort of just plain being disciplined and what the tips Diane gave are really good. A place yeah. where you go, your stuff is all there. You don't have to gather all up. We figure out your space and then it just let it roll. And even if you come back and decide it's terrible later, at least you have something down. But anyway, more ideas. What's some other ideas? Go ahead. Um, publishing for me because I made some mistakes. Okay. Other dreams, ideas. Go ahead. <laughs> I feel like I feel like God told me to write a couple years ago, and, okay. and I'm and I'm trying, but I feel sort of stuck. So okay. I'm here because I thought maybe this would unstick me. <laughs> <laughs> Couple more. And then we're gonna... I think mine is twofold. I have, as I've told my story to people, many people have said you should write a book, okay. and so that has something that has stuck with me. That, but my journey continues. So, 
Um, you know, I don't know where that where the story ends, but um, I think there's a specific time in my life that I'd like to, if for no other reason than for my children and my children's children and so on, to be able to read upon the day that I'm gone. Second fold is I've worked with kids my whole life, and I did some homeschooling last year, and I realized that I couldn't find the books that I wanted to be able to teach on in a Christian, from a Christian perspective. And, and maybe I just didn't look hard enough, but but I was like, well, I could come up with something better than that, <laughs> you know, or something that's more Christian-based than what I'm finding. <laughs> so that's yeah. my second challenge there. Great. Well, there's lots of stories. And like I said, it's, it's, it's as variety as filled as it is outside the window is reasons why you're here and your story of your story. And we do want to encourage you that your story is, is so important. There's so much out there that's that's not from the Lord that we need some more things that are from God right. out there, whether it's teaching material, whether it's a blog, whether it's to encourage, um, even just positive social media. I mean, I'll tell you, there's our lead elder in our church, Doug Westgate, just did a social post with just a simple question that brought so much joy to people. It was a turkey vulture looking in the window, <laughs> and Daryl said, what does this mean? And so many people just got such a hoot out of that, just a well-written thought with a picture that just went out, and just people enjoyed it. And you know, bring joy to people, that's fine. Um, it's great to do uh, Bible studies, it's great to do curriculum, we need all of it, we need, we need joy. To, and I want to encourage you know the personal stories, the the long books, the short books. I brought some samples along, and I realized they're all long. And I'm like, I have to get something that's small because small. I think you did you mention that, Diane? Like small can be really effective. A short blog, you know, an article that you wrote that ends up in local communication can really help bring awareness, bring change, bring funding, um, grant writing. You know, all this all the different styles of writing. This is a small book that Larry Kreider wrote that we just redesigned. So the thing about writing is once it's here, it's, you have it. You can you know, re-sculpt it, you can update it. Like we just updated the House to House book. This was written in like 1996. So it's pretty old, you know, there's a lot of change that happened. So this is actually the third, third edition of this book. So again, the, the, the work went into it it was reworked, and it was reworked again for a new generation. So when you get the work, get the pen to paper, start typing it out. Um, it can be a tremendous blessing for human generations. It's not just for today, tomorrow. It's you know for years ahead. Um, there's different ways to do books. This one it was more like some of you talk about writing your memoirs. This is this. By the way, I had to bring this one because we had two editors quit in this project. <laughs> this, was, this was simply a very difficult project because what do we put, what do we include? I mean, what, literally, you know, there's, and there's no end of stories that could be written. So anyway, this was difficult. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Um, so, like, size-wise, how many words or like the first one, the house to house. How many words is that? This is about 70,000 words. Okay. Okay. Oh. <laughs> and there's some of them have appendix in the back. I know like the elders book, there's a lot more context. Con like we just are seeing this translated into Spanish. Mm -hmm. The first chunk is the book and the second chunk is appendix that we can do later. Okay. Um, that just save a little bit of time, get the get, get it out there. Yeah, here's where like all that's appendix. So, uh, Small projects like this, again, like it can be worked and reworked, sure. and you know, put online, um, printed in a small How many format. Words is that? Well, you know, that's a good question. This one, this one wouldn't be a whole lot, thousand maybe, yeah, thousand. fourteen hundred. Um, this is a book that was Kelly. You might learn this one. Uh, this one is a compilation project, so working together yeah. to bring to bring people together, like our community did a devotional uh, years ago that was really powerful that brought Christians in our region together. Um, this yeah, one's a great book. I remember we had we did a couple of them. This one was 24 different voices. 
so they were short articles that people um, submitted and they were edited, you know, pull it together, make the language consistent, and help, bring, help to educate people on trio ideas. What you say? I did a, a recent article for another one and I got it back and it was all red. <laughs> <laughs> but I was so excited because she liked the content and we could still do it, you know? But I looked, I looked, I was like, there's a lot of red on this. <laughs> but she, I loved everything she did with Good. it. Okay. And yeah, it was exciting, so. <laughs> trust your engineer. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. well, I liked her ideas, and she did get, do a back and forth with it, but it just, I was surprised at how much red came out. <laughs> and I'm glad for that. So. Yeah, edit, editors are important, and you do need to trust your editor, but that's not without thinking. Yeah. I mean, so, a yeah. lot of thought mm -hmm. goes into to some of these projects here, you know, whether they're short or long, and uh, I, I'm just helping out. Know, an author finished. It took him years, okay, to do. And often, often that is the case. It takes a couple years um, when someone starts writing. They may get input from others around them, yeah. colleagues. It might be family members who read, give input. You know, think we well, need some more stories. You know, this is weak. I don't understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Develop your manuscript or you know whatever it is. Even if it's an article, get other people to read it, give That's input, right. and listen to them. Yeah. Different times, you know, you may be on a committee, but that doesn't mean anybody you're heard. Right. So if you ask for input, then you know, please. It doesn't mean you have to do what they say, but it's right. important right. that you tr you listen carefully. Yes. Yeah. So, well, and, and the thing with that is, I had a certain amount of words I had to have, and I think I was just a little bit over, so she was, you know, trying to put things to make it fit in the article. Like I had too many words, and so I well, understand and, that. And cutting. honestly, yes, if you're part of a, a group project, yeah. like for the devotional that our community put together, there's some people that submitted double the amount of words. Right. It's supposed to be like 350. Well, they submitted 800. Well, what did that mean? The editor had to work really hard. And, it, and some of these people that did this should have known better. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. When you're asked to speak for an hour, you don't speak for two. It's true. Yeah, I mean, you respect, you know, or even just pay attention to what you were asked to do. Um, well, mine was in two hours, but it was a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so I, know, yeah. Just I understood the red. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is another book. That's, that's part of the dumb values that, Diane, you want to tell us about it? You're working on it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But there's it's, the, in, it's in a revision process. It's in a revision project process, and it, that takes a lot of thought and careful communication, too. And people may not agree. And, and I, brought the, I had to bring this book because four, four of four. the people oh. wrote this book, but Larry said he'll never do it again. <laughs> because it was so difficult for four people to pull together, and you know he'll probably end up doing it again. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it is difficult when you have four voices coming together and yeah. every who gets the last say. Um, so so that would be something if you want to pull together a group project, maybe decide who has the last say, who has the last say on the book. Um, and because God made us all different, go ahead, Ruthie. So you, one of the challenges I'm finding as I'm writing is I go off on a rabbit trail, and I feel like there's like this little article that could stand alone, but doesn't really go with the book. So can you elaborate a little bit on what kind of articles you're looking for? Because I've never heard a request for articles. Well, we look for news reports, and we have articles on the Dove International website that we look for for things that are written from from people. But honestly, if you've got a rabbit trail. That may be a great another chapter or you know another another section. Uh, that is one thing that happened with the the book that Diane referenced, where it was really rough. And the other thing, it was shockingly long. It was 110,000 words, which I don't think we've ever had anything that long that was that rough. And so and it was just repetitive. And he had you know, but some of those things we did simply pull out. This is for another book. You know, and so it actually, when you're in the writing stage, don't feel like you have to have a finished product. Right, I mean, right, right. It, you can you can move things it. around, chapters around, sections around, and you know, don't lose those thoughts necessarily at the writing stage. With the green light, just go ahead and keep driving. I'm also realizing that <laughs> you alluded in the last class 
um, a couple of months ago, you alluded to the fact that you can age yourself by if you put two spaces after a period. Oh. Or one. <laughs> and I, for the life of me, am trying to retrain my type into one space. But just type it oh, and no then more. do a control F. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Don't. Yeah, I'll let the that. editor do it. Yeah, no, that's e easy fix. Easy fix. <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. Easy fix. The, the hard part is getting it down. What did you, you age your stuff with your what? Uh, two type, spaces after a, a full the type, stop. The typewriters, we used to put space, space after a uh, Punctuation. Oh. If you after learn how to type a typewriter versus a laptop. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Or a keyboard. You put two spaces after a period. <laughs> but we don't do that anymore. Oh, we, we don't, don't do, do that anymore. anymore. Oh, yeah. You just with with word processors yeah. now. You just do. I don't one. know why that changed. Well, it's because there is a fluctuation. It's because when it's justified, when the word processor justifies in your text messages, it's just too much space. Or do you? Absolutely. I still do, and people tell me. Each and every one of you that are here today, I did want to encourage you that you're probably the who. You are called to write. Um, you're called to write encouraging words in texts and emails. You know, that's the, the base. I mean, your words can be so important. And, you know, to younger people, to family, your words are so important what you say. Your words are so important to write. You guys, you're writing all the time. Maybe it's a sermon, but at least, if nothing else, it's an email or a text. So if you learn how to write well, the world will be uh, blessed in so many simple ways as well as you know a big way with a book. Uh, so who? It's probably you. It's a matter of what is the is a question that may be answered in, in years or decades. Uh, what the project that I just talked about where they had 110,000 words. He took a year of Saturdays to write down his story that was amazing and started his ministry. It's just amazing how God is using him. But if you want to done it, would he have it? And he actually told me recently that because of his book, he made connections with, with two men who have uh, become part of his program, oh, I understood him right, who is like his drug and alcohol recovery. So um, your story can change lives. Uh, and I don't want to pressure you, but just so you know <laughs> that if it's not written, I mean, you can verbally share your story, but your books can go places uh, that you cannot. I mean, you can be left in somebody's coffee table that a family member reads it and comes into the Lord, or you know, goes to another nation um, with something on the internet and like changes a whole family. Uh, so know that uh, whatever it is, you know, God has a call on your life, and various ways it can be used. Um, I'm hoping that it's many different ways, all of the above. And maybe you will get your own book, and that would be sort of a large project. But I hope many of you get in many of these different processes so that God can use you through the written word.